Hello, hello, what is up, what is good? We got a new chapter of One Piece. This is 1120 with the extremely exciting and kind of provocatively loaded title Atlas, which can be parsed in a number of different ways, all of them pretty exciting. Like A, it could be a reference to the ancient Greek Titan of mythology who was punished for some sort of hubris by having to literally hold up the world on his back, a very famous image. Uh, it could be referring to something that has that level of significance in the world of One Piece in terms of holding the world up. I don't think that's super likely, though. Could also be some character named Atlas, uh, which would be super, super exciting because that's such a loaded and significant name and just such a damn cool name that any new character we're being introduced to, especially at this hyperclimactic stage, is probably coming in the form of Vegapunk's ongoing message, briefly delayed, um, and therefore, you know, somebody pretty hype and cool. Uh, but I think most exciting and probably most likely is the reference to Atlas I was actually referring to an Atlas, that is a map of the world which is something that we've never really seen in One Piece. Uh, we don't, we have good reason to think it doesn't really exist uh, because Nami's dream is to complete a full map of the world, a full sea chart. Uh, and it would be kind of lame <laughs> if they were like, well, here, here's one that already exists. But it could be like an atlas of the ancient world or something that uh, Vegapunk was somehow able to discover. Maybe they had it at Ohara or something like that. I don't know. Let's find out. I'm pretty excited. I think no matter what happens, it's pretty damn exciting. Uh, we're starting off with the cover page. Of course, Yamato continues to travel around Wano. This is kind of a more decrepit area of Wano. This looks like where a lot of the factories and stuff were put in, and therefore conditions haven't, you know, just miraculously instantly 180'd. <laughs> uh, the pestilence and pollution and uh, degradation of crops and stuff is still ongoing. So do your best, Yamato. Uh, and what the hell is Denjiro up to? Sentences the children. <laughs> so Denjiro is left in charge of Kibi. Yeah, Kibi was a pretty desolate place I can remember from Wino Arc. Uh, so what the hell is he doing? I have no clue. <laughs> good, good luck, Denjiro. <laughs> okay. 26 years ago in Punk Hazard. This, uh... It's pretty crazy to see Punk Hazard before uh, it reached its current state of being the battleground between Aokiji and Akiinu, where it's half on fire and half covered in ice and generally just very desolate and scary and crazy. Uh, back then, it's kind of set up like Egghead. You can kind of see the, the style that Vegapunk likes out of these big island labs. <laughs> Lots of palm trees... Kind of cool vibes, you know. And he's being implored by Dr. Clover. The more we require expertise in other s fields. Now the, yeah, so this is currently a marine lab. Um, the symbol of, like, the big horned skull, in my mind, like, reminds me of Kaido, but I, I don't think there's anything to do with Kaido. Exactly where to find it. Surely you know why they continue to allow you to live. Biding your time can you wipe out and round up. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Hmm. One cannot measure the good and evil of the past. So I think... Oh, and look, it's his little baby pet dragon. That was the big dragon they fought as soon as they got to Punk Hazard before. Uh, I think, yeah, this is what significantly changes for Vegapunk is he probably had this opinion for quite a while. You cannot measure the good and evil of the past. And therefore, why why am I putting myself at risk learning about these things in the past when, in the end, pretty much all I can say is, oh, well, I guess that's what happened. <laughs> and I think probably what changed is that he eventually recognized that this good and evil, the whatever battle was unfolding back then, is still unfolding now, and that the world government is actively doing things now in relation, not just suppressing study of it, but continuing on the work of the Void Century or whatever. Uh, that's my guess, is that was the revelation that made him kind of change his mind and make him into an activist. 
for lack of a better term. I saw once, I once saw a man with the name of D killed right before my eyes without warning. The man I was born and raised with, my older brother. My true name is Cloud D Clover. Another D. I only survived because I lied. How is it right that a person can die simply for declaring the name they were given at birth? Yeah, so this is the sort of thing I'm talking about that Vegapunk realizes, like, oh shit. This stuff isn't, you know, just good to study. <laughs> it's not just for the sake of studying history. This is something ongoing. Secret history whose traces are continually erased. So I can tell you is be careful. Voices of the past will be heard. Crazy, crazy. Another D. It feels like, oh my god, we have so many Ds. When you think about it, it's like, what? Like a dozen or so? Luffy, Ace. Uh, Trafalgar Law, Blackbeard. Uh, the, 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 the Clover, we know now. Jaguar, the Saul. Uh, there's others. There's definitely others. Oh, Rox D. Zedek. I'm pretty sure. Uh, you know, he's dead now. And then Clover's brother, I guess. So he's dead now. Mm, there's gotta be more. There's, there's more I'm not thinking of. At any rate. <laughs> it's like... Feels like there's a lot. But then at the same time... <laughs> there's like 3,000 characters in one piece. <laughs> So the ratio is actually still extremely low. Although, have you seen the memes where people are pointing out celebrities through history that have the middle initial D? Like, Kurt Cobain is Kurt D. Cobain. <laughs> uh, the angry video game James Rolfe is James D. Rolfe. Makes you think. It makes you think. Anyways, I also want to point out this is a very emotionally charged scene, very intense, you know, kind of a tragic scene because we know, of course, that Clover ends up indeed massacred along with all of his uh, loyal comrades. And yet it's being carried out by a man with like the most ridiculous haircut ever and a man with a gigantic head because his brain keeps growing. <laughs> and that's the beauty of One Piece. Okay, meanwhile, 22 years ago, Ohara annihilated with a buster call. Clover the archaeologist, they finally caught him. Oh, uh, freaking Caesar Clown, such a little bitch. Again, this solemn shot of Vegapunk with his tongue down to his waist. It's just so beautiful. Single child escaped alive. Yes, and Vegapunk visits the lake full of books. This, of course, leading to Saul's eventual recovering and stuff. You, all of you die just to preserve this vast store of text for the future. It's preposterous. What lunatic would dare risk certain death to continue your research? But that's what he is doing now. Someone once said that the voices of the past will be heard. History is told by the winners. And the, loser, the voices of the losers are at the bottom of the sea. Oh my god, I'm, I'm too excited to read properly. <laughs> I'm too just like pumped to see what happens and try to actually read stuff out loud. I'm stumbling. At any rate, we can see here. Uh, it's interesting the choice of people we're seeing in this moment. Because... First, this is the prison colony that's building a bridge between islands that Robin was sent to, and then Robin herself. But then before that, we get a shot of Chef Zeph, Sanji's mentor, who sailed for a year on the Grand Line, but then eventually beat a hasty retreat back to East Blue. Now, is it just that we haven't seen him yet in all of these people reacting to Vegapunk little cutarounds? Uh, maybe, maybe. That's, that's the simplest explanation, and perfectly fine explanation. Uh, or is there actually some sort of connection? Is he being depicted as one of the, the losers of history? Somebody who just kind of, like, faded into obscurity, and now has this faint voice as he just tends his restaurant out in the middle of the East Blue? 
I do not know. I do not know. A shot of Robin. Very emotional. She remembers. She knows exactly what Vegapunk is talking about. Well, it's been told to the world just now. Not going yet. That horse Gramps is going to attack us again. Can't leave. It's going to accelerate to fly a distance of a kilometer, but if you manage to reduce the run-up speed at all... Hmm... Uh, pretty scary. So at this point, Zoro has just been kind of parrying him and fending him off. Hmm, so then what's the plan? Hey, wait a minute. There's already a character named Atlas. Oh my god, I'm so foolish. I'm so foolish. Atlas is one of the Vegapunks. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I got so excited. Uh, I hope I hope anyone watching this that's like, what the hell? Alice is the Vegapunk. What are you talking about? It's not some new thing. It's not a a map. <laughs> it's talking about the aspect of Vegapunk called Atlas. Uh, anyways, <laughs> there there she is, Atlas. Punches Lilith. <laughs> Lilith, the one that was trying to delay them was Lilith also kind of betraying Vegapunk Lilith's aspect was that she was the evil one <laughs> which again it's like it makes sense this idea that Vegapunk had to portion out all of his emotions all of his categories of feelings all of his different impulses and I can kind of see why that leads to like the best work you know to have all of these forces represented in this sort of harmony of antagonism or whatever but it's like so like what was Lilith doing in this moment telling them not to leave because what she said kind of made sense take care of Lilith fly I'll remove the obstacle okay so maybe just it's in Lilith's nature to not have any sort of faith be skeptical at all but now this is kind of crazy atlas is going to fight <laughs> one of the gorosei and based on all the other vegapunks you feel like she's gonna get washed but atlas is the personification of strength right <laughs> that's the element that she represents uh so maybe atlas is actually like unfathomably powerful and is just gonna deck this gandhi looking motherfucker and lay him out in one punch but we already saw atlas fight and lose earlier didn't we like way earlier in the arc alice was involved in fighting and alice wasn't like insta winning <laughs> uh she i think was just kind of like fighting and struggling okay anyways jimbei decides it's time regretta for too slow to act they fire off the coop they burst Atlas's arm gets sliced off, but she plows into him. Her rocket boats pushing him back. The horse geezer flying off. I can only pray that this message has made it safely out to the world at large. <laughs> Giant robot is back. Luffy is freaking out. The Iron Giant. Everybody's pumped. I'm so happy that Frankie was here to see it too. How inspirational for him. That a robot could be so large. Oh my god, this is so funny. And again, just like... This This is a very climactic moment. Where Luffy is addressed as Joy Boy. Directly. For the first time. He is made aware that people are calling him this. And think he's this entity. I'm talking to you. And they do it in such a comedic way. <laughs> the giant robot has to like rebuff him because he's not getting it. <laughs> Be foolish to hear about a war 900 years in the past from only one side. You go ahead. Your enemy is my enemy. And I'm so happy I get to fight for you again, Joy Boy. <laughs> you 
not end Vegapunk's speech unless we shatter this thing to pieces. All right, let's go, robot. I mean, it may be that, like, both of them should just retreat and escape so that it can keep transmitting. <laughs> but no, the robot's loyal duty is to Joy Boy. He must fight for Joy Boy. He wants to protect someone named Joy Boy. Who's that? It's saying something? I don't hear it. Oh, it's funny because, like, we're operating on such a high level at one end where we, the reader, are getting so much lore information and at least, like, turbo locked-in readers like me are, are trying to, like, sort through and piece together all sorts of theories and, you know, connect the dots on, like, every little piece of information that's been given to us over the past 1,120 chapters. Uh, but then <laughs> to the character that's, like, at the center of all of this, that's most involved... <laughs> Really has, like, no clue what's going on. Can't even tell that he is, like, subliminally receiving this voice on a non-verbal level. And is surprised that other people can't hear it. And these giants are kind of doofuses as well. <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure they have, like, very, very strong tactical minds and, and ancient wisdom. But they, like, don't even, like, recognize how crazy a lot of this stuff is. And they're just like, well, it's a, it's a robot. <laughs> Ah, man. Don't sail away. Fire. Okay, okay. And then in parallel with all of this, the the strongest channel of direct lore information we've ever had continues. History requires a multifaceted approach to understand entirely. If only I had more time on my side. Alas, there are forces outside my ability to stop. You know, the, all these moments where Vagabong's speech ends up almost coincidentally parallel with something that he's describing being depicted happening at that moment. It's really good. It's <laughs> it's just some, like, really expert cinematic-style storytelling. I love it. I love it. It's winding up. It's going to shoot something. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. All of the robot's functions are not currently online. Also, it's big thing on the back. This big, like, screw-looking thing. That looks like it was supposed to start spinning to, like, power it up. It kind of reminds me of the, the giant bows on the back of the samurai in, in Wano. Like, Odin had a big bow like that. Is that a coincidence? I don't know, ma'am. Anything is possible right now. Uh-oh. Ooh, the robot still manages to fend it off. 900-year-old weapon. Of course it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, Frankie understands what machines are and what they do. I, I don't know if Luffy really does. <laughs> I feel like Luffy has, like, a very childlike understanding that this is some sort of, like, supernatural living entity. <laughs> and fair be it to him, because he heard the thing talk. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Saint Saturn jumping onto the giant ship. Okay, the Sunny launches forward. Ooh. And then Atlas self-destructs, propelling the ship forward further. And caught needing the, the, the horse geezer to regenerate massively. He won't be able to pursue them. That we're gonna make it 25 years ago the pirate gold d roger completed an unprecedented tour of the entire world and what and he what he and his crew heard is little old me oh that's <laughs> i thought <laughs> i got the, the the transmission bubbles mixed up <laughs> York is saying that she is the only Vegapunk left in the world. Not that Vegapunk, for some reason, is saying that Roger, at the end of his tour, heard a little old Vegapunk. <laughs> now while Estella continues to Babylon, stop it at once. 
what he and his crew heard were likely the purest voices of the past. In conclusion, as I'm sure you've all surmised by now, my view of the future is thus. Gold D, Roger. Yeah, this is the first time... Well, there's another D, obviously. That was a pretty major one. And Raleigh is also, I think, as well. Uh, my view of the future is thus. Okay, this is it. Even the prisoners in Impel Down get to hear the true history of the world. And yeah, this is the first time that Gold D. Roger, as his name, has been broadcast to the world. It's all coming together. And also, the robot is going to use some insane final self-destructive attack. I'm going to use it okay. Oh, man. Okay. We will find out next week. What the heck is going to happen next? Crazy, crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. Let's look forward to it. Uh, do I have any, like, speculation or anything? I mean, not really. <laughs> that feels kind of futile right now. So, bye-bye for now.